So I'd like to welcome everyone today to my interview with Warren Mosler. We're going to be talking about the national debt today. Um, could I get you to introduce yourself? Uh, sure. I'm Warren Mosler. I am 74 years old. I've been in financial markets since 1973, so that's about 50 years. And I, um, I'm the uh, founder or the originator of what has come to be known as modern monetary theory, which is why I'm here. Absolutely. And um, what are your um, publishings? So I've published numerous articles in uh, economics journals, including uh, the post-Keynesian journals and mainstream journal of the Journal of Policy Models, where I last published um, along with Professor uh, uh, Silipo, Damiano Silipo, of Calabria, uh, maximizing price stability in a monetary economy. And uh, I've also have a, a book, um, The Seven Deadly Innocent Frauds of Economic Policy, which I self-published. Thank you. So I'm going to ask my first question. What is, what's the mainstream claim about the national debt from the way you went? Uh, you know, there are all kinds of them. And, uh, and, and if we look at the Obama administration when they wanted to do what they called their stimulus package in 2009, uh, he and the president and his secretary of state Clinton flew to China, who they presumed were our bankers to make sure that they would buy the debt so that we could pay for what you know, our health care and our, you know, run the government. Uh, Paul Ryan, who was, um, uh, the head Republican speaker of the House, he was uh, arguing that if we borrowed this much money, our national solvency was at risk. We were going to uh, go broke. We we're going to be able we'll to find ourselves on our knees in front of the IMF begging for money. You had, uh, I believe, Paul Krugman had a stack of papers on the president's desk uh, talking about how high interest rates would go if they did this. And, uh, and so you've had all this um, fear mongering about the national debt, which is why it's actually what motivated to, to start me uh, with soft currency economics back in 1993 about uh, that's, that's just completely backwards. So I, I, I and if, and if you um, look at uh, President Biden with the stimulus, which was something like 2 trillion for um, um, COVID, none of those things were mentioned. All they mentioned was that they were concerned about inflation. And that, that is the whole MMT understanding that the public debt is not a solvency problem. It's not a financial problem. It may be an, lead to an inflation problem, but that's what you should be discussing and not those other things. And, that, and that's exactly what happened over those eight years. Okay. What led you to believe that, because um, you mentioned you, know, you started a lot of this, what led you to believe that um, everything that's been talked about, the national debt, was inaccurate, that it was wrong? Uh, it was my direct experience in financial markets. I'd, I started at, uh, I worked at Bankers Trust years before in 1976 on the, um, we were one of the, maybe the top uh, primary dealer, Fed dealer in, in the world. And uh, on the trading desk, we uh, had all the securities traders there. We had all the money traders, the Fed funds traders. We interacted with the Fed regularly. And it was part of the general discussion and from that, I got a very quickly got a working knowledge of how the whole thing actually works. And then um, later, when this uh, deficit issue became this major issue, it's just clear to myself and anyone who actually understood monetary operations that this was all just a gross misconception of what actually takes place at the operations level. What is the national debt in reality? So the what we call the public debt is nothing more than all the dollars spent by the government uh, <clears throat> that have not yet been used to pay taxes. So the government spends maybe $5 trillion, you know, $4 trillion might get used to pay taxes. And the other one trillion is still out there. The government has spent it, it's in somebody's account and it remains outstanding as outstanding tax credits. That's what dollars are. Uh, until when and if uh, somebody uses those funds to pay taxes. Otherwise, they're just going to change hands and be outstanding. And uh, 
and that constitutes what we call the national debt. It's the net money supply in the uh, economy. It's the equity, financial equity in the economy that's supporting a credit structure. Now, those that trillion dollars outstanding will take one of three forms. You can have it in actual cash, little green pieces of paper. You can have uh, transactions balances at the Federal Reserve, which are called uh, security uh, reserve accounts. It's the Federal Reserve Bank, so they call it a reserve account. A normal bank might call it a checking account or something like that. And then you can have accounts at the Federal Reserve Bank that a, a normal bank would call a savings account. But of course, they give it a fancy name and they call it a U.S. Treasury security. So a U.S. Treasury security is just a savings account at the Federal Reserve Bank. You give the money and you get it back with interest, just like any other uh, certificate of deposit or savings account at any other bank. And so the public debt is <clears throat> when, the, when the dollars get spent by the federal government, they uh, go into checking accounts. And from there, they either can stay in checking accounts called reserve accounts, or some can be taken out as actual cash. The Federal Reserve will give you a green piece of paper, or they offer treasury securities for sale. And you can shift those dollars from the reserve account to a securities account at the central bank. But all three together would still add up to the $1 trillion. And that's still the dollars that the government spent that haven't yet been used to pay taxes. And it's nothing more than that. Now, is the U.S. government a currency issuer? Well, when the, the U.S. government uh, established what's called the Federal Reserve Bank under the Federal Reserve Act, and that's their one of their agents in, of Congress. It's like, you know, Congress doesn't fight wars. They have soldiers who fight wars. So Congress has agents that are federal uh, employees that do things, you know, at their behalf. So the Federal Reserve Bank is, a, is an agent of Congress and it has accounts like any other bank. And it has accounts for all the major banks. It doesn't take accounts for individuals. It only takes accounts that you call wholesale accounts, which would be major banks and or, or all the member banks. I think there are 4,000 member banks and um, some foreign central banks. So it'll have an account for the European Central Bank and the Bank of England and whatnot, but not for you and I. So when the government, when the treasury makes a payment, uh, the way it normally works is that they will uh, credit the account of one of their member banks. The, and, that, and if, they, if you're an employee, it, and you have a bank account, your bank account is with a member bank, a bank that belongs to the Federal Reserve. And so the government spends by crediting uh, an account of your bank, you know, at the Fed. And, and that, that bank will then give you credit for that money. So, okay, so the way they say it technically is the government of, let's say you're a postal worker, they'll credit your account at maybe JP Morgan for further credit to uh, Shane Coughlin. And so that's, that's how the accounting is kept. And so what the government does to make payment is they change the number in the account of JP Morgan from, you know, a million to a million 1,000 or whatever your payment would be. And all they do is change the number from whatever it is to a higher number. And that's how they make payment. Now, you can call, you can say that's being a currency issuer because what they did was change the number to a higher number. And you can say that's the issuing of currency, but you know, it's, it, that's would be a, that would not be a technical description of what they are, what they do. Technically, they have uh, the central bank, which is has accounts, and they change the numbers up, they change the numbers down. They're the scorekeeper for the dollars in that bank, uh, and it's certainly not wrong to call it a currency issuer. But uh, that could be um, people who have ideas of what issuers do. You know, print things up and distribute them. Uh, if you issue. Uh, coupons, you print them up and distribute them, they might get a different picture of what's actually going on. What's actually going on is they're just changing numbers up and down on, on their on their own books. So just a couple of clarification questions. Yeah, so yeah. every dollar, every paper dollar I have in my wallet, that's part of the national debt, correct? Yes. Now that dollar came from the, the way, how did it get there? The, the uh, government credited the account of J.P. Morgan. They changed the number to a higher number. J.P. Morgan then credited your account, put $1,000 in your account of J.P. Morgan. You then decided you wanted a dollar bill. So you go into J.P. Morgan and you say, I want a dollar bill. And they say, fine. They give you a dollar bill that comes from the Federal Reserve Bank. And they change the number in your account from 1000 to 999 Okay. And so that's how that dollar bill got there. 
It came from the Fed Reserve. Uh, when the Fed Reserve gave it to J.P. Morgan, they changed J.P. Morgan's number to a lower number when they gave them the, the, the dollars, the actual dollars. Okay, so it's a scorekeeping thing, and it's t like taking some of your score home from the bowling alley on a piece of paper or something. <laughs> <laughs> so when politicians say, we're yeah. going to be paying back the national debt for years and years and years. And this is a burden yeah. leaving on our children and grandchildren. Yeah. That's, true. that's that's because they, they say that because they have the sequence backwards. Okay. <clears throat> the national debt already is the money. When Congress pays you, you have a number in a bank account. That is the money. When you decide to put it in a savings account at your own bank, you still have your money. It's just in a savings account. If you put it in a savings account at the Federal Reserve Bank called the Treasury Security, it's still your money. It's it's a number in a savings account. And you might have bought a five-year Treasury Security, which means it's a savings account where you'll get interest for five years. And then at the end, you'll get your money back, right? So you still it's still your money the whole time. So it's so what they actually owe you is when the Treasury Security matures, is they just shift your money from the securities account back to the reserve account, from the savings account back to the checking account. So if you open up a savings account at your bank, your your number in your checking account goes down, the number in your savings account goes up. And how does the bank pay you back? They make the number in your savings account lower and they make the number in your checking account higher. Nothing's changed outside the bank. They're just accounting for it, uh, shifting from one place to another, one account to another within the bank. So what these congressmen are saying is that at some point, all these dollars we have in these savings accounts at the Federal Reserve, we're going to have to shift them back to checking accounts at the Federal Reserve. It's like, yes, so what? You know, it's not like a, anything anybody cares about. They do it every month for 50, 60, 70 billion dollars as bonds mature. And some get you know rolled over and some don't, and they'll shift dollars from uh savings accounts to checking accounts like all the time in very, very large size. And there are no grandchildren and no taxpayers anywhere near that room when they do it. It's totally independent of that. It's just an accounting shift from one account to another at the same bank. So it's just an accounting record. Yeah. And they, yeah. And the record changes from saying we have a record of your money being in a savings account called a treasury security to we have a record of your money being now in a checking account all at the same bank. And so it's, it's like, fine. It's just, it's not a, an economic event. <laughs> it's, it's not, it's nothing that affects any market or anything anywhere. It's, it has no consequences. So when Congress passes a bill, let's say yes. Congress passes a bill for $5 trillion to pay. for yes. Yeah. Um, and then they say, well, now we're $5 trillion in debt. What's the reality there? Okay, the reality is they spent the five trillion, and, th and there was no tax. This would be deficit spending that they would be talking about, and they credited whoever they paid it to. They credited their accounts on the Fed's books, and those accounts might be J.P. Morgan, Bank of America, Wells Fargo. All these banks got credit for five uh, trillion dollars. The Treasury then, as a matter of policy, uh, puts five trillion of tr Treasury securities up for sale. And um, at auction, they go to the highest bidder. So, and then the dollars that are in those checking accounts that the government is, is spending uh, get transferred to these savings accounts when people buy the treasury securities. Okay, so the treasury spends the money that those dollars are used to buy treasury securities. So the dollars are now in savings accounts at the uh, Federal Reserve savings account called treasury securities. That is called the national debt. Now, there's a reason they call it that. Uh, in the old days, those dollars were convertible into gold and you could go to the government and get your gold. So it was a debt that the government owed you. They owed you gold for the, that money. You know, that's not applicable anymore. That's been gone since 1934. But that's just what the accountants call it. And it's not wrong. The other thing they owe you, if you have dollars anywhere, is they owe you the right to use those dollars to pay your taxes. And so from an accounting point of view, that's a debt. It's a liability. They have to accept those for payment. 
but you know that goes without saying anyway it's nothing uh anybody would care about it, it's you know it's not news there's no news there so uh, uh did i answer your question now in in, in actual practice okay the treasury is required to sell the treasury securities to borrow the money so to speak to have it shifted from checking to savings before they spend it now how is that possible it isn't if it hasn't been spent there there are no dollars there to be shifted to buy the treasury securities <clears throat> so the way they uh people who work in government have gotten around that political restriction is that the first thing that happens is the federal reserve itself lends the five trillion dollars to the what are called primary dealers who then buy the treasury securities okay the treasury uh then uh spends the money okay and then those loans get paid back and so it's like uh you know so they've thrown in that extra step to get around this political restriction that says uh the treasury has to borrow first now unfortunately that political restriction isn't you know it's not understood <clears throat> what the workaround is and it's the work it's been a workaround forever you know for you know hundreds of years it, it's not a, well no, i'm sorry the primary dealer system has probably been seven, 60 70 years and and there were other workaround systems before but they, but they because they don't understand the workaround system, it has the appearance that the treasury has to borrow to be able to spend because it has to sell these $5 trillion of securities or it's not permitted to spend. Not that it can't spend. The Fed Reserve can always spend money on behalf of the treasury just by changing numbers, but it has to take its orders from Congress. So Congress has put these restrictions on itself saying the treasury can't spend unless they borrow first. And then there's a workaround where the Federal Reserve lends the money to buy the Treasury securities. And so that gets that's the whole workaround. And it's never been a hint of a problem, you know, to, to get this done. And it's just, the money, it's just circular. It's been going round and round for 60 years. And, and it's it's not it turned it's not a, an operational restriction. It's not an actual restriction. Uh it's vestigial, it's from the gold standard. It's still there. It doesn't affect operations, but it affects perception. And so there are people who read this thing that the treasury has to borrow and they go, aha, what if they can't? What if they don't sell it? Then we won't be able to spend. And then we'll, this is like Paul Ryan, then we'll be at the IMF on our knees begging for money. Well, he'd be right if he could take that restriction on, you know, on face value. But you can't because it's a restriction with a walk around altogether. And he's ignoring the walk around that's, uh, ironclad and it's been running successfully for you know trillions and trillions of dollars for forever Oops. okay so at the end of the day yeah the debt is not what people think it is it's not a burden it's just an accounting right. record um and yes what about the people who say, well, we're going to have to pay money back to China and we're going to have to pay money yeah. back to this and that? How do, how do you respond? Okay. Well, if, you, if they say we have to pay money back to China, that's because China has treasury securities, treasury bills probably. Well, they already have them. That's already their money. It's already sitting in savings accounts. You know, which, and we send them a bank statement, right, which says you have money in your savings account. And as I've said before, you know, the only thing we owe China is a bank statement. Now, if they... When there was treasury securities mature, we will shift those dollars from their savings account to their checking account, from the securities account to the reserve account. We'll send them a bank statement that says, okay, you now have the same dollars, but they're plus interest. So you have a higher number now, and it's in your uh, checking account at the Federal Reserve. Uh, you know, thank you very much for your business. Tell us what you'd like to do next. China only has a few choices. They could um, spend the money. In other words, make a payment, tell the Federal Reserve, okay, we're buying some a jet plane from uh, General Dynamics or something or Lockheed. Please debit my account, credit their account. So they can spend it, okay? Or they can say, uh, okay, well, we'd like to have it back in our savings account. We kind of like that interest. So please, uh, we're buying treasury securities. Please debit our uh, checking account, credit our savings account. Or they could say, you know, we'd like, instead of getting a bank statement from you, we'd like to just uh, get a green pieces of paper, you know, send us a uh, trillion dollars in cash, actual cash, which is a bank statement on green piece, written down in green pieces of paper. 
And so China would have that bank statement. But there are no other choices okay. you know, that they can do with that. They can either buy something. Now, they could buy uh, euros, but they're still buying something. They'd have to find somebody to sell them. And they'd say, okay, we bought euros from uh, Barclays Bank. Uh, please debit my account for the euros and please credit debit the dollars from my account and credit the dollars to Barclays account also at the Federal Reserve because we just bought euros from them. And, and they don't even have to tell them what they're doing with the money. They'll just say debit our account and credit Barclays account. And, and there's, no, there's nothing else they can do. Once they've sold their hair dryers or tires to Walmart or whatever they're selling and they've agreed to take payments in dollars, that's what they have. And they knew what they were getting before they sold it. It was all voluntary. They would rather have the dollars than the hair dryers. And mm -hmm. so, uh, and they know they only have those three choices, spend the dollars or shift them between accounts at the central bank. So the United States isn't going to go broke if we don't pay back the debt? Well, you know, you got two separate things. Number one, go broke. What, what does that even mean? You're saying the central bank won't be able to credit your account to make your payment as a postal worker? What, was it going to get an electric shock if it tries to change the number? You know, so there is no going broke is not applicable for the scorekeeper. So if, if you're in a football game and you kick a field goal and you had 10 points, now you have 13. Well, are you worried that the scorekeeper might go broke and not be able to give you those three points? Not really. I mean, it's not like an applicable worry. And so uh, because all the dollars are accounts at the Federal Reserve Bank, which is Congress's spreadsheet, and its payment is just by making credits to that account, the idea of going broke is not applicable. Anybody who uses that language is like missing the point. Okay. And then you say not make payments. Well, we could choose not to make a payment. Congress almost agreed to not make payments last summer when they didn't pass the debt ceiling. Passing the debt ceiling is an agreement to make the payments you promised to make. If you want to default on your promises, sure, you can do that. <clears throat> uh, that's just, uh, it's not about your ability to pay. It's about your willingness to pay. Uh, people can renege on promises all the time, even if they have the money, even if they have the resources. So those are two different things. Absolutely. And I appreciate you joining me today. Okay. This interview. And okay. hope to see you again.